This video doesn't really focus on the pond, but more on the filtration system, which is what I've been asked to cover. But first, a very quick history in pictures. And here's the new filter room, set quite well below the new ground levels, which is the fence on the right. In the view of the actual inside of the filter room, well, it's a shed, insulated, again scratch built. We'll start at the far corner of the inlet chamber, back down through the uh, Profijum Combi Bio 30, which has been modified. Two four inch pipes come out underneath, underneath the step into the uh, filter room into the sump, it's the end of the first gravity run, up through the airlift, into the anoxic chamber, it's the start of the second gravity run, through there, back round the pipe, you can see at the far end horizontally, into the outlet chamber. From the outlet chamber, it then goes back another four inch pipe, gravity fed, back to the pond. So we'll start with the inlet chamber. I like inlet chambers. Back in the early 1990s when I built my first proper koi pond and filter, I didn't use things such as 4-inch ball valves or special koi equipment because it was so expensive. Luckily, building materials were quite cheap. Also quite cheap then was reprocessed polyester resin, so I was able to build my own block and glass fibre filter system, gravity fed. And into that, therefore, I had an inlet chamber and an outlet chamber. I had standpipes and I also devised the standpipe valves, all very, very cheap. The standpipe valves worked so well, I thought I'd use them again, even though really I could have afforded ball valves if I wanted to. So how do they work? They are extremely simple to make and operate. They therefore are incredibly reliable, very simple, don't go wrong. And honestly, I would use these in preference to ball valves, given the choice. Anyway, back to the inlet chamber. The right-hand side uh, standpipe valve is for the skimmer and the left-hand one is for the bottom drain. Uh, if I want to purge the bottom drain, I can either close both the valves, drop the level in the profi drum, or better still, I have a separate chamber not shown here, which gives me an instant 70 centimeters plus of head with a standpipe, which gives me a very, very rapid flush, much better than the conventional flush, which I do about once a month. Also, with the standpipe chamber like this and the inlet chamber, I see the water coming in, actually see the water, and all of course my water testing I do just here. I need to go out to the pond because this is pond water coming in and very easy to access. Before we follow the actual filtered water to the next stage, I want to briefly mention this, which is the auto top-up system. The black cistern has its own separate connection to the ponds. So the level inside there is pond level, not filter level, because filter levels can change all the time depending on flows. Uh, ball valve inside the system, um, sensitive ball valve for stainless steel weights for micro adjustment and a little weir and overflow in case of the pond getting too full. Uh, it's fed by declinated water through a meter and the water coming out of this valve does not go back into the system, which would change its own level, but goes back to the outlet chamber. This is the Profidrum Combi Bio 30 with the UV switched off uh, and the moving bed on the right hand side. Beautifully made, scarily expensive. This uh, photo, uh, taken when the drum filter was empty to do some modifications, shows all three mods that I've made to the system. The left hand side is just simply a plastic baffle which stops the UVC shining through into the media chamber. Uh, the orange is a float 
which is a sort of a homemade inch and a half valve. So if, for example, the filter gets blocked for any reason or the power goes off, the devil will drop in there and that will open to allow some water through the system. More on that later. And on the right hand side, you can just about see down where the grill is a sliding plastic panel. And that effectively opens and closes to allow water through either the moving bed or to bypass it through two four inch holes at the bottom straight to the anoxic chamber. So from the Profi drum, there are two four inch pipes, 110 mil, which flow into the brown sewer pipe you can see, which is a 10 inch, 250 mil sewer pipe. Uh, its length and size you can see from this picture. I made up my own connectors there which so far are holding up quite well and inside this pipe or the sump you can see the actual airlift itself again the size from the scale of the door. We're talking about a lift here of between 12 and 17 centimeters and that variation is due to the cycling of the drum and its rinsing. And from there, we have the water flowing into the anoxic chamber. The other things in this picture I'll come back to later. And so to the anoxic chamber itself. I took an awfully long time trying to work out how to do this and eventually decided to have my own custom chamber made, which was cheaper than I expected, especially if you just have a very simple plain tank made. Um, the tank itself would not be able to support the water, it would be too floppy. So I used um, 10 mil stainless steel threaded rod to brace it, but at the same time these bracings were also the supports for all the racking to hold the anoxic baskets. So here we can see the uh, top row of 15 anoxic baskets, regular sized, uh, all supported with water flowing all around them, and at the end I've repurposed my backy shower media. So from the anoxic chamber through another four inch pipe we end up in this which is the uh, outlet chamber and in the bottom of that you can just about see a submersible pump that is the pump which works the water feature uh, and to service that pump you simply just unscrew the union pull it out it's obviously being fed clean filtered water so there are never any blockage problems uh, at the top you can see the four inch outlet which goes back to the pond gravity feed to a directional nozzle on the end and on the right hand side you can see a blanked off plug. If I unscrew that plug that's blanked off and put it onto the outlet to the pond, what I then do is I force water from the outlet chamber straight back through to the inlet chamber so the filter is recycling itself. So if I'm doing some filter flushing and it's a bit dirty in there for a while, I can recycle through the filter until it's clean and then divert back to the pond. Likewise, if, for example, I need to work on the pond, I can lower the level of water in the pond, but keep the water up to level in the filter, which, given it has a drum and an airlift, levels are very important. And very last, I have that right-hand side is a slightly lower section. That is a weir. If, for example, I get a dead fish or a dead cat or something else gets caught into that outlet, is there could be a flood in the filter house. If the outlet gets blocked for any reason, all will happen is that weir will overflow deliberately back into the inlet chamber and again it will recycle. There is heating for the pond, but only emergency heating. In other words, it only kicks in if the temperature drops below about 6 degrees Celsius. Uh, this is the control for that. There's a temperature probe in the water coming into the filter. You didn't see any heaters because I have uh, four 600 watt drop-in heaters which sit in their own float pad which sits in the outlet chamber and they're only put into the filter during the colder months which is why you haven't seen them today. This is monitoring the main airlift air pump, 80 litres per minute air pump. It shows the voltage and it shows the current. The current meter in this little device is terribly inaccurate, so ignore the actual values. But what I know is, when it's working properly, it's between 0.4 and 0.6 amps. So if it was to change from that, I know something needs to be investigated. Quite a few years ago, one hot summer when we were on holiday, uh, we lost quite a few fish. As I said, it was very warm, and I think it was the fridge or the freezer in the house tripped the electrics. So the filter stopped working and after about a week of very hot stagnant days in the system things went very very badly. I wanted to avoid that this time around. 
So I'll go through the systems one by one. First of all, there are two separate power supplies to the filter. Two different supplies from two different banks of the main consumer unit. So if one RCD bank goes, automatically, via a simple relay circuit, the other one will click in. If we go back to the top of the uh, airlift, I built a small float chamber and inside there is a float switch. The chamber is connected to the top of the airlift by a narrow bore pipe because that dampens out any fluctuations due to the turbulent water. The reason it's placed here is, is that basically the most important thing in the whole system is that water is flowing through the airlift and I'm getting circulation in the filter. If for any reason the amount drops below a certain level, this switch will be triggered, which starts off all the rest of the various backup. The float switch being triggered could be caused by a whole number of things. It could be a power cut, which means there's no power of any kind. It could be that the drum is not working properly and getting clogged, in which case the level on the clean side would drop further and further and be too high for the airlift to manage. It could be the airlift pump itself has gone wrong. Split diaphragm, for example. It could be a leak elsewhere in the system. It doesn't matter what causes it. What matters is what happens next. So there's a 25 watt low power impeller pump which can cope with the head from a say a blocked drum which is down inside the sump so i've got this 25 watt impeller pump for backup but what happens if there's been a power cut well luckily i have approximately 220 amp hours of backup battery supply which run through an inverter to power this um, backup pump for approximately between four and five days when the backup pump is kicked on, I get notification by a SIM module which sends a text to my mobile phone to give me a pump alert. I can also, that's assuming there's power in the house, check into my CCTV which is actually monitoring the pond temperature and the main air pump and backup pump displays. The backup pump display is only on when, of course, the backup pump is working. But again, I can make sure it is working and I can see what current it's drawing, just as with the air pump. The drum filter has been an extremely important innovation in the realm of koi keeping. But I do believe it does have one Achilles heel. It does remove fine particles from the water really, really well, which means they need to rinse quite regularly which means if they can't rinse or they're not turning round or there's a problem there they also can clog remarkably quickly most of them come with a removable panel or removable plugs but you need to be there to do it if you're not there within a very short time the filter can get to the stage where the drum is only allowing through literally a tiny tiny trickle not enough to sustain a filter and that's why i built in my little float bypass which is an inch and a half pipe which isn't a lot but it's enough to guarantee there's enough water for my little pump to do some circulation and keep the filter alive. So let's summarize the key features of this filter system. Once into the filter all of the water goes through the drum and the smash in the drum removes all the suspended particles in the water. Then pathway one is the water goes through the moving bed, which is the normal nitrogen cycle um, filter in most ponds, where that ammonia is broken down to nitrite, nitrite is broken down to nitrate. From then on, it would go on to the um, airlift and into the anoxic chamber, where hopefully um, nitrate would be further broken down to release nitrogen gas, but this isn't the most efficient way of using an anoxic chamber. So we have pathway two, where I divert water to bypass the fluid bed through the airlift and into the anoxic chamber. So I'm feeding ammonia in the water into the anoxic chamber, where that gets broken down directly um, to nitrogen gas, which means there shouldn't be any nitrate end product. So this whole system is now uh, gravity down to the airlift and then gravity from the airlift back to the pond. 
The airlift is consuming about 55 watts to give me 15 to 17,000 approximately litres per hour. And that's what it was taking me 160 to 170 watts to do with my previous conventional pump. So there is a massive saving from that point of view. Also, of course, the airlift is aerating the water like pretty much nothing else can. So all in all, I'm extremely pleased with this and I hope you found it interesting.